Is it possible for the wake to drive the boat? That is, can a trail that is left behind make a boat go in this direction? And of course the answer to that is no, it can't. It's just a trail that is left behind. And in that trail, there are an enormous number of things and every one of us has a wake. And we have a whole lot of stuff in it. And one of the problems that we have is that we have a tendency to look at the wake and all of the stuff that's in it to explain why it is my life isn't working the way I would like it to work. So that um, you can take a look at the experiences of your life. I look at the experiences of my life. And the experiences of my life, I spent some years in a, a series of foster homes. People have said to me, oh, living in a foster home, that must have been terrible. I said, no, it wasn't terrible at all. When you're six years old, you don't wake up every day and say, oh my God, I'm living in a foster home, isn't this awful, poor me, how come me and nobody else? You don't do that. You don't do that till you're 40. <laughs> and when you're 40 and your life isn't working and you're bankrupt and you're a drug addict and, and, uh, and you're falling, your relationships are all falling apart and your family's leaving you and you say, why is this happening to you? You say, what do you expect from me? I had to live in a foster home. My mother liked my sister better. We were to this, we were to... And so it's like, we take a look at all of these things in our wake. And I'm not saying here that you shouldn't be in touch with your past and all of the things that are back there, but to use it as excuses for why you can't get where you'd like to get today is something that you, if you do that, you will never get to this place that I'm talking about in this program, which is this place that I call higher awareness, way beyond ordinary human awareness. One of the most powerful lessons that you can ever learn, I had to learn as a young man. My own father was a man who uh, walked away. He left. He left home when I was just a baby. Left my mother, who's sitting right here, <laughs> 107 years old, is that, no, you're not 107. 82 years old though, and, and with three little boys. And all I had ever heard when he walked out about this person that my older brothers told me about and that uh, when my mother got her family back together again when I was nine years old and, and did all that she could to, uh, to make a family again, with all the hardships, this was a man who never made a phone call who never sent a penny, who spent some time in prison, who was an alcoholic, who died of cirrhosis of the liver at the age of 49 and was buried in a pauper's grave in Biloxi, Mississippi. And it wasn't until I went to his grave and was able to stand there, and I used to dream about this man and have this enormous hatred for this person whom I had never seen, just based upon what he had done to my own mother and to my brothers and so on and all of the stories that I had heard and all the research that I had done and I ended up at his grave ten years after he had died when I finally found out that he was dead it was on the 27th of August it was 1974 and what I did transformed my life what I did is I believe I was sent there by God or whatever you want to call that divine spirit, that divine presence. And my life at that time wasn't working. I was overweight. My relationships weren't working. My writing wasn't working. There were a lot of things that weren't going well for me in my life at that time. Not badly, but they weren't going at the level that I knew I was capable of getting to because I was filled with this hatred, this anger, this bitterness. And so what I did is I stood there on his grave, on this little marker in the ground, and I said, from now on, I send you love. I forgive you. Mark Twain said that forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. And once I let go of that anger and that hatred and all of my attachment to the bonding that I had done with these wounds and let go of that and cleared that out of my life, my writing began to take place at a much higher level. In fact, I wrote erroneous zones in very, very short time after that. I began to get myself back in shape. I began to eat better. I began exercising, keeping my, uh, got my weight down. And 
the people that were supposed to come into my life, like my beautiful wife, who sits here with me this evening, and all of our children, some of whom are here this evening. <laughs> all of it was allowed to flow when I released that, that energy of negativity and blame and hatred. They say that you never die from a snake bite. It isn't the bite. And you can't be unbitten. It's in the wake. What kills you is the venom that continues to pour through you long after the bite has taken place. And that's something we have control over and we can change. And I'd like to suggest that what happens is that many of us bond ourselves to these wounds of our past. If I were to cut my hand, just cut it and watch it, my nature says, close up the wound. And I just have to watch it. And there's no doctor out there, there's no medicine out there that's going to heal that wound. There's something, there's a healing stream that I am connected to that will allow that wound to heal. So my nature says, close up the wounds. Don't bond to them, don't hang on to them, close them up. But supposing I say to myself, oh no you don't. There's no way I'm going to let you close up. <laughs> you see, if I can keep you open and I can go to you and say, look at this. You say, what happened? Well, look at this cut I've got. Oh, you poor thing. Look at that. It seems to be getting worse. It's getting infected. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? And if you practice this kind of a mentality, when your nature says close up the wound, but you keep it open, before long you lose your hand. And after that you lose your arm. And the whole organism will be destroyed if you don't let your nature take over. And your nature also says close up the wounds of your past. Close them up. And oftentimes we ignore our nature. I had a great teacher that came into my life through his writing. His name was Nisargadatta Maharaj lived in India up until the mid-1980s. And he wrote something called I Am That, which was very powerful and influential in my life. And one of the things that he talked about when he was asked the question, what's the difference between, say, a saint or a highly functioning human being, a spiritual master, a spiritual teacher, and the rest of us? Is that they have unconditional love in them? and you don't or we don't and he said no he said saints have unconditional love in them and so do you he said the difference between ordinary human awareness and higher awareness people is that they have nothing else inside of them that's all they have and it's almost like we have to learn how to get that in ourselves to be able to well I always like to use the metaphor of an orange I love the orange. Perhaps living in Florida is why, but... <laughs> An orange is a simple metaphor. You take this orange and you squeeze it as hard as you can squeeze it. And you ask yourself, what will come out? And what comes out when you squeeze an orange? Orange juice. Never, no matter how many times you squeeze it, will apple juice come out. There's no mistakes. You'll never get grapefruit juice out of this thing, ever. The only thing you'll ever get out of it is orange juice. And the next question is why? Why when you squeeze an orange, as hard as you can squeeze it, does orange juice come out? And I asked that question up in Toronto one time, and this little girl sitting right in the front row, she said, that's dumb. <laughs> it's a, it, she said, that's what's inside. It has to come out. I said, well, that's the answer. <laughs> you are really smart. And she smiled, and she thought that was great. But that's the truth. The reason that orange juice comes out when you squeeze it is because that's what's inside. Now you extend the metaphor and someone squeezes you. That is, someone says something about you that you don't like. Someone behaves towards you in a way that you find offensive. Somebody does something or says something to you that you feel hurt by. And out of you comes anger, hatred, bitterness, tension, fear, anxiety, stress. And immediately you say, the reason that comes out of me is because of how he said it or the way that she said that or because they did that. But the truth is, the reality is, that what comes out is what's inside. And if you don't like what's inside, you can change it. Now if you ask me, how does orange juice get inside of an orange, I would say, I don't know. I can't figure it out. That's a mystery to me. I just enjoy the oranges of my life and give God the credit for that.
A lot of people think that other things make them the way they are. They will blame their past, they'll blame their parents, they'll blame the economy, they'll blame the Ayatollah, they'll blame somebody for things that are going wrong in their life. And one of the favorite things that we have to blame for why I'm upset at a particular moment is something called traffic.